wherever you're joining us from, a very good morning to each and everyone. We, I'm going to talk to you from this way. Tabitha, you're here with us this morning. Another day is the second day of April in the nation, 2024. Tabitha, good morning and all those persons who are joining us live. Good morning to you guys. Good morning to you, Sharon. Uh, hope you had a good weekend. Uh, good morning to all the viewers, everyone coming on live. I hope you guys had a good Easter. Hope everything was safe and you enjoyed the time in the sun. It was very sunny this weekend. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping yeah. that you were able to fly your kites and all of that and you're ready for the work week. Uh, ready for the work, not week. work week. But ready for the work week nonetheless. We are hoping we are hoping that, that they are. And we have on with us this morning, Tabata Indo, if you can see. Christopher Chichester. So folks, I got some filter thing on here. We're trying to uh, work around. So if I look a little whiter than Tabby, it's not so. <laughs> We're trying to work on whatever filter we have up. But good to see Dolly is here and Latchman Aziz is here and Donald George and uh, Sandra Hanover. Good morning. Uh, how was your weekend, Tabby? The guys, we hope that you had a good week, a good weekend. Uh, my weekend was good. Um, on Sunday was my birthday, uh, so yes, yes, Sunday yes. Was a special occasion. Um, on Monday, I took the, well, my husband and I we took the children out to the national park, and uh, they enjoyed themselves. I did not go into the sun, but I think he did a good job. <laughs> good job trying to get their kites up. Um, and that that sun was scary on Monday. I'm very sorry. I stayed as much as possible under the tent and looked at them from the from that location but it was a good weekend how was yours my weekend was fairly good to tabby thank you thank you very much for asking um like you i went out a little bit yesterday uh, but didn't celebrate a birthday like you a year wiser <laughs> i hope <laughs> a year wiser De definitely so without with, without question a happy 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 belated birthday and thank we hope you had a day well spent um we we wish you many more of course and all of those good things no doubt you wish yourself thank you very much much appreciated it was a good day excellent let me let, let me just encourage folks to share the live as we are on it's the morning after the night before and oh so much happened over this uh, very long weekend that we have had um folks you know we had rodeo and what a rodeo it was you know tabby what a rodeo it was. Uh, we had some star attractions, of course. Um, Air Finale was there at this rodeo. I don't think anybody remembered that Air Finale was in the rodeo. I, I don't think so. Why would people not remember that he was there, Sharon? I don't understand what you're It's reading. just a fact, Stabby. It's just, <laughs> it's just a fact. I don't think a lot of people remembered Air Finale went to the rodeo. Camille Cox, I done share for a lot of reasons that that will be made clear uh, shortly. <laughs> I think it was an, it was an eventful weekend all around. I think some of us have more fun than others. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some of us tried new things more than others, yeah. but I think overall, I think we had a you know it was an eventful week. I guess we we'll get to that eventually. But a, a lot of in the Rukunoni. Yeah, so, a little too much fun, uh, if you ask some people. Um, we were we were very concerned that um, the Minister of Education was trying to mount a horse there and seemed to have had uh, some challenges. And we learned that, you know, um, <laughs> uh, things uh, worked out in the end. That's how life is, you know. That's how life is. We, we, we heard of things in, in the very end. <laughs> We don't give up. We don't give up. Yeah? We don't give up. That is that is that that is the crux of it. We don't give up. Folks, take take a look at uh, some of what we saw at rodeo, especially this uh, mounting horse exercise gone wrong. Yeah, and that's how some of that went down, Tabby. Um, we just we just happy that the that the Minister of Education, Prem um, you know, is okay because that that could have gone much 
it's yes, much it more could wrong, have. Much it more could wrong have. than it did there. And again, uh, just happy that in the end, uh, things worked out well. That was Region 9, where the rodeo went down. Let him central. And as that was happening, folks, uh, the president made a, a, a $1 billion uh, announcement of investment uh, for the Rupununi. And I like when we I like when we unpack some of this, you know. I like when we unpack some of this because it's not everything that glitters. Not everything that glitters is gold. And when we and when we um and when we get down into the weeds and we unpack it, we see exactly what is what. Again, there was this one billion dollars investment over the weekend. Um, I hope you guys can hear us clearly for the Rupununi. Um, it, uh, 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 and it says it's aimed to initiate, or, or rather, it's it's aimed at government's initiatives for growth and sustainability in the Upper Takatu, Upper Essequibo region. And so we are watching that. Um, also said over the weekend uh, is, is the fact, quote-unquote fact, that the government has uh, delivered or in the process of delivering over five hundred thousand pounds of cassava now this is something that we discussed since i was there in let i think it was in january and this shortage of not only cassava but by products of cassava like farine you know um there in that region and that is more important and bread and more important and lots of the staple so we are accustomed to on the coast farine is a main 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 staple in in the hinterland and so uh that cassava shortage was since in February. But folks, I want to advise you, um, that should not have been, that's one of the issues that should not have been happening because uh, the government of Guyana in 2018, I think it was, Tabitha, uh, put down a cassava factory there, part of which was aimed at stockpiling for the ones for better phrase, uh, cassava for such a time as this. Um, and when we were there, in January or I think it's January or February of this year, uh, we had a chance to visit that location uh, that is proposed as the cassava factory in Letem. I think this is as an area, um, I don't know if it was Mokomoka um, centrally or at least it was close to where the hydro project is. And as you can see here, this was implemented by the Kanuku Mountains community representative groups along with the Canadians and the government of Guyana. Look what it was aimed at doing. Alleviation of the negative effects of natural disasters in Region 9. Just like now, when you have this drought happening and a shortage of cassava. Tabby, I was at this building. I saw the equipment that are in there to produce the farine. I saw it all. And it has just been abandoned. Tabitha, do you know why this has been abandoned by this current government? Do you know? <laughs> has it a guess? Because it wasn't started right then. Aye. That is the crux of the matter because it wasn't started by them. So we see this um, uh, approximately 500,000 pounds of cassava. They said it was delivered to deep south communities. Um, there, they said they're going to do another um, 20 million to be distributed to areas like Napi and surrounded villages. Um, and they're going to try to do a cassava mill also at Napi. Now, if this mill was actually used, was actually used, right? You see the inhabitants of the cassava factory there? The counts use it as a respite uh, from the heat, a shade. This building was built in partnership with the hinterland and in partnership with the canadians everything is in place tabby everything is in place well yeah and 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 uh, <laughs> you know what is so interesting i was reading the article with this new found recognition that something is needed there now and i was wondering based on what you said and even the fact that they're asking for more money that is not budgeted, which means they're going to come back to Parliament just now for more money to deal with this issue. There's also, based on what you're saying, the reality is that they make sure that it's not working and then they're going to um, now put in a set of money for the same um, the same space Correct. and then say, oh, 
we have yeah. now introduced to you something that will help your community when it was there all the time and they decided not to put any monies into it to ensure that it it, it, it can do what it was created to do in the first place um i i don't understand the mindset of the, the people who are governing this country they can't look at something and say well because it was started on the granger we don't want to continue it um and at, at the detriment of the people in that same community because now they have to fly in things that they could have, they, they, that they shouldn't have had to do because of the fact that they decided they didn't want to use this particular building and this particular manufacturing plant. I, I the, the, the thinking behind the persons who are governing this country is just, I think it's almost the level of asinine. Because how could you decide that you do not want something that would work for community? You just put it in a corner and then you come as if you're the savior. Remember, I remember, if, if you remember last week, I said they create a problem and then try to make themselves, themselves feel as if there's solutions to the problem and they're not the solution, they were the issue in the first place. But here we have it and we will continue to have it and then they'll come to parliament asking for billions of dollars and when we question them, it will look as if we don't want persons in the communities to get money and that is not the issue. The issue is the way in which they're managing the resources of the country. We're seeing out there and that we're trying to make sense of they said in addition to this um a part of this one billion dollars for the hinterland i mean this is a this is this is this um because i have a factory that's already there at uh mocha mocha there in uh, in region nine in letem is available to all why go and start something else when what you have that is there okay. is not even being utilized and i saw folks saying that they're not using it just because it's painted green, right? But I don't know because, you know, these are folks that are just as petty as that. So when folks are talking about all this development that's happening and that they're seeing, look, if we could have saved whatever money they're going to go and do another cassava mill or cassava factory with in some other project, look how far we could have gotten. That place is sitting down there doing nothing and they can come and argue it has no equipment in it. Well, I saw for myself. I went right up to the windows, right up. I didn't venture inside because I didn't want, you know, they would say you break and enter and you do this and try to all manner of things. The equipment is right in there. All the facilities are in place for the wickedness, wickedness. They said in um, part of this one billion to the hinterland to the Rupununi, they're going to be, uh, there's plans to establish service hubs, including buyers hubs and procuring and preserving it, uh, rather aiming at procuring and preserving excess fruits, um, cultural and educational hubs, food support, integration hubs. Now, I find all this is coming um, on the eve of general and regional elections. They had four years to do all of this, all these hubs and hubs and hubs and hubs. But Sharon, isn't there an industrial site there? Then under us, didn't we create an industrial site where a person should be able to do all of those things there? All of those hubs are supposed to be there. But you know what, Tabby? Part of that, a huge... Part of that industrial site is where they're housing the warahs. I was there too. I was there too. Yep. Yep. A huge chunk of that industrial site complex, the land there, has been giving out in a very ad hoc manner to house the warahs there in Region 9. These are things that are not coming up in the press conferences of Jack Dio on Thursday, interestingly. But this is why we have to go on the ground to see what's happening and come back and say to Eva and Andrew and uh, Camton and Mark, this was happening in our country. This wow. is not development, this is backwardness. Wow. No, but Sharon, this is so, oh, as you're speaking, what is coming to mind is it's a waste of resources because if monies were already spent to create a, a, a industrial site, to create these hubs for persons to be able to do exactly what they're trying to say now, and they let that go to waste, and now they're saying they're going to create their own it's spending money twice for something that has already existed and they're doing the same thing with the factory. Yeah. And so now it would look as if they're now doing something new which has already been done before. You're spending double the amount of money to get something done that's already there. And, and it's wasting our resources that we don't need to waste. I don't understand the way in which they, they function. I really don't. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, Tabby. Um, over the weekend as well, as part of this whole... Um, Rupununi hub business that's happening. They said they're going to be sending some black tanks as well 
uh, because you know there's a drought there to alleviate some of the hardships of um of of the water woes of the folks in the Rupununi. And this is a subject, uh, for instance, of the column coming out of Kaicho News. And this is Pippin Tom's column this morning. And part of what Pippin Tom is saying is that this initiative should be seen as, as a proactive intervention to tackle poverty and to promote equitable access, Pippin Tom says, to essential resources. All well and good. Uh, prima facie on the face of it, it sounds all well and good. But Tabby quite recently, the leader of the opposition um, himself, and I think it was Vincent Jordan, Vince Roy Jordan rather, Vince Roy Jordan, our colleague Vince Roy Jordan, who made a trip to the Rupununi themselves and reported on some of these water wars that was happening. GWI came out and maintained that it had a 98 point something percent coverage. So why all of these millions of water tank <laughs> now heading to the hinterland? It's fascinating on that front, what they're trying to do. And folks, as you know, as I said, I was in the hinterland uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and saw for myself, you know, some people in their yards, they have their own uh, um, ground well and so on. And they say government has been trying to move them off of their ground well onto a, um, what would you call that? Like put them on the water grid then. Yeah. Um, and it's not working out. Of course, it's not working out. So they're moving them from uh, the ground wells there, that's a shorty, to yeah. black tanks and something else that is just not just not working out. This is one family that I visited, and I was amazed at the whole ground well operation. I even helped them uh, to pull up some of the buckets there, trying my hand at it, and we were going to water some plants there. So this is the reality on the ground. Tabby, little Dubai, black tanks. But, and I, and I, I remember when there was this whole thing about 98% water coverage. And But in Region 9, I remember on the our tenure, we started building a lot of wells in that particular region. Um, I think with some assistance from Brazil um, and the Brazil Army, we were building some wells Correct. in that region. And Correct. I'm, I don't know whether or not that has continued. Um, or, or whether or not because it was a project that started under us that they did not continue it. I don't know where it is. I have if they abandoned the cassava factory there, man. If they abandoned the cassava factory there in Mocha Mocha. Yeah, it doesn't have it, to be it, more it, than just black tanks. Tank. What is the permanent solution to the issue? Is it black tank? And I, I'm trying to understand the the thinking behind the, the, the decisions that are being made. Um, there's a reason why they were digging wells. Um, I'm not sure how, if it is that you're trying to create a system where water will now come to you through black tanks and even on the coast, we can't get water 24 hours uh, a day. Um, and once there's blackout, of course, you know, half the, 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 the tongue, the, the water stops flowing. What will happen in those regions? Um, and so I think I, I really look at how it is they're approaching uh, their governance. They really look at how they're approaching no water, but everything. I think they, they need to really take stock of what governance means. Feasibility studies are important, and understanding what is necessary for a community before you decide that this is how we're going to deal with it because this is what we may do on the coast. Yeah, you know, somehow the maths is not matching because if uh, Van West Charles under the coalition government did all that fantastic work with water supply in some of these very areas, building um, additional um, ground wells and so on. If they're claiming, uh, based on what we've done and what they're doing here, we got 98, 99 point something. You mean that uh, point something percentage is what we're seeing here in the in the Rupanoni? Something is not adding up. Um, it, it, it is either we have all of this coverage and okay. this black tank money going to somebody who needs to sell a million black tanks or something is just not adding up here. But it's the PP government you deal with, so you just don't know. You just don't know. Tabby? Yeah, and, and <laughs> we just don't know. And I think the, the, when we get to Barrett's statement, uh, the Minister of Natural Resources, we see something else not adding up there. But they seem to like numbers um, and to give the impression that the statistics are in their favor um, and they're doing better than people are suggesting. When, when you go on the ground, you realize that the reality is not as crystal clear and clean and bright 
as they're trying to make it out to be. Yeah, it's different. Uh, folks, we have with us this morning, uh, welcome if you're now joining our broadcast. We do have with us Debbie Collins and is it uh, Alicia Simon Griffin? And we have Tracy Clark. As usual, thanks, Tracy, and all the other folks like Sharon who joined us this morning, Sharon Mercurius and Mark and all the other folks. Guys, take the opportunity. If it's not going to get you in trouble, to share the live if they're watching your LMP even at your uh, smash that emoji button for us. Uh, good folks. Um, you know, it was quite a weekend. It's not only the kites that were high, they put the, the, the police car who made a huge uh, cocaine bus at Virgin Nugent um, over the weekend as well. A thousand pounds of cocaine. Um, they, they, this don't get no owner tab. Is the is the um is the one gram and so on? It's got owners to send people away for you know six years and so on, but the thousand pounds and the two tons of Belgium and the Netherlands and so on. They don't have any owner. You think somebody can say foreign to this is weird? <laughs> I mean, anybody you're seeing right now is a small fries. But they didn't. They, I don't know. I don't think they, they named anybody in that shipment. They got. Yeah, they said, I don't think so either. They said they, they got two persons that were on the board, but they didn't name them. But you know what? I find this very interesting, Sharon, because this is off. Where, where did they find the board? Virgin so Ocean. Virgin Ocean, right? So they got a tip that something happened and they were able to get it before it went on international waters or something like that. And then we won't hear, you know, who it actually belongs to. For me, this comes across as a, a, a charade. It comes across as um, them it, uh, trying to show the world that they're trying to do drug bust, but they it will end up right back in the hands of the owners and it will end up going exactly where they intended it to go. That is how I see it. Because something of it seems very off. How it was done, the fact that no names will come out, I'm quite sure that you won't hear any arrest being made um, outside of the two persons that were on the boat, and it will not go to trial. So if it goes to trial and somebody's actually in jail, then I would say maybe I was wrong. But I'm quite sure this is just a whole um, charade so that they could give an impression to the international community that they're actually trying to do some work and they're getting some of these persons off the streets. Yeah. Misdirection, they said, it was an operation between uh, the police, uh, Kanu, that is, and the Coast Guard. They said this was uh, 536 uh, kilograms of cocaine with a street value of 2.6 million US dollars. And they said, had they, this gotten to the, its destination, could have fetched a value of uh, 20 million pounds. And as you said, uh, Tabby, investigations are ongoing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like how. I like how you said it there. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Will you see where it leads? You keep track of that story. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that being said, folks, we're, we're also following the death of a prisoner. And this is at uh, Lusignan. And this is, uh, his name is Anthony Prince. Uh, over the weekend, he was stabbed to death, they tell us, by Shamar Davis at the Lusignan prison. Uh, and Prince died while receiving medical treatment at the Georgian Public Hospital Corporation. And they said this whole argument or altercation uh, stemmed out of a teasing over each other's girlfriend. Life is so cheap in this country, Tabby. It's too cheap. Too cheap. Uh, just condolences to the family member, family of the, of the deceased. Uh, you know, as I, I read this particular story, what was what bothered me? Uh, the question that I had was whether or not um, our programs, because this process went in for robbery, right? Um, they, they committed some robberies and so they're in jail uh, mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, but what are our rehabilitation programs like in our prisons? Um, is, it, uh, is it doing what is re it is required to do? Uh, because... You know, some of the reasons why persons go and rob, and so sometimes we don't know, sometimes, but during these rehabilitation programs is where they get to the root of some of their issues, some of their, you know, might be societal, might be environmental, might be some other things that are causing them to end up in a life of crime that, you know, can be dealt with if there's a proper rehabilitation program in the prison system that would, you know, anger management and those sort of things could be dealt with. And so we don't end up with these cases. And that yes, they may be doing their time, but they don't lose their life while serving their time. And hopefully they can come out of the system better than they, they went in. 
but I don't see a lot of thought going into rehabilitation programs in these systems. And so we end up with a lot of, of, of what will happen and, and, and start to say somebody had to lose their life. Yeah, you know, it's still kind of fascinating how, um, again, how life is cheap in this country. And, you know, we, we, we offer our thoughts and prayers to the, to the family of the bereaved. The, I saw also Director of Prisons, Nicolon Elliott, expressing his condolence and offers of support. But that don't bring back the dead. You know, sad to say, post-mortem, we say colloquially, don't bring back dead. Um, and so Nicolon Elliott and the others got to go beyond that. Um, but just taking a human life easily in this country, so commonplace. Um, another issue we're following on the, on the same tenor is that of Jared Jagnandan. And this was um, a, a shooting of a, a, at a Lusignan car dealership on the 21st of March. Jared, uh, just a teenager at that point, his parents are asking for justice. He said, a lot, lots not adding up here. Um, as concerns Jared's uh, this fatal shooting of this young man um, at this establishment on the East Coast. Um, again, this is um, this occurred at. Let, let me make sure I get it right. On March twenty first, twenty twenty four, and the parents, his parents, wants answers, and, and and rightfully so. They said they blame uh, the management of of Shaft Auto Sales and. Uh, Cerebus Security Service for not acting appropriately after the incident. Um, and of course, the family says that they are broken and anguished at the lack of details surrounding their son's death. You know, again, it's just how life is taken easy in this country. Based on what we know, Shera, and most Guyanese know, if you know somebody who knows somebody, then even if you're guilty, the, the, the possibility of you actually facing some time um, becomes negligent because you may know somebody and be able to speak to the right person um, to get yourself off of that particular issue. So it's, it's really a sad place that we're living in when you end up in that situation and you know that you will not be able to get any justice uh, because of how the system is so corrupt at the moment. Yeah, how does this thing work? I'll tell you another issue here, and for those watching us, like John Jones and Lawrence McKenzie, Sheila Boychild and Ron Luan Hall, the family's concerned with a lot of misinformation uh, that's out there as, as well. And this, again, is the family of Jared um, Jagnandan, who lost his life uh, after being shot at this auto dealership on the East Coast on the 21st. The family said the police, in the police report, they said he was a handyman but according to his uh, job description at this uh, this auto sales, and he was a marketing sales and projects representative for the past two years and not a handyman. So the story not even straight coming out of the police force. Trying to make, to diminish who he is as a person, to make it not seem as important to go off to whoever it is that's actually accountable. That, you know, it, it, it's, it's really... And I've seen this play out in other, in other societies, so it's not something that is new. Is that when something goes wrong, you try to make the person who is actually the victim look as if he's not worthy of that status of being a victim um, because you want to let the person go who actually committed the crime. So I, I, I only wish that um, the authorities will take stock and actually get to the bottom of what actually happened and... Um, those persons who should be held accountable, be held accountable and justice is served in this situation. Yeah. Again, the family in the shooting death of Jared Jagnandan, they're calling for justice. Is any family what? You know, let's get it right. Again, a police force. I know sometimes you do um, get it right. Um, it's not a lot. It's not everybody in there is, is bad eggs. We got a lot of bad eggs in there. You know, a lot of bad eggs in there. This is a lot. Um, tell me one of the other issues that 
you you kind of preempted early on was this of the Minister of Natural Resource, Vikram Bharat, who says that Guyana's non oil economic growth is the second fastest in the world. This is sugar, this is rice, uh, this is, um, what do you call it? This is the um, gold and diamond and so on. The second, non oil, everything that's not oil and gas, fastest, second fastest in the world. Tabby, you could unpack, <laughs> unpack the crown for us. <laughs> I, would, I I can't on but what I would like him to do is to show where he got his statistics. Um that is that is the person because I was looking to see where it is he found that information and I can't find it anywhere. So if he could press yes, <laughs> I should probably do that in party, right? Ask him the over the statistics that led him to that particular conclusion. I think that that is a very good question um to ask of him. But it's the reality is, Sharon, that first of all, the oil sector should, if it is that you're trying to diversify the economy, any sensible government would want to do that at this point. You would use some of the resources from the oil sector to sort of boost your non-oil sector and to get it up to par to where it should be. So saying non-oil sector is sort of an iffy thing in this particular um, stance when you're using a lot of the oil resources to boost the other sectors. So it's not really separate and apart from each other. So that's one. Two, the other issue I have is that when you look at the 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 what is happening in the oil sector, I cannot see what he is seeing. Um, I am not saying that things are, they might be upward tick, you know, they might be doing good in, I don't know, but Based on my assessment of what is happening, I don't see us being the second, um, what second highest economy in oil. I do not see it. I would like. I really need him to show me that data. I don't know what he's looking at. You know, part of this, part of this. What's interesting here is that oil is feeding into so much. If you're yes. taking all these billions out from the natural resource fund and plugging it into the work of other ministries, how are you going to say in the oil sector alone? Exactly. You, you, you know, is this um, uh, showing all of this kind of growth when the oil sector is being buoyed by what is happening in the oil sector? But that's interesting. But part of what Vikram Bharat is saying is that the sugar sector, for instance, Tabby, saw a 28% growth in 2023. Where are you getting this? This is sugar they import in and repackaging, right? The, 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 and, and, and uh, you know, if sugar is doing so well, why are they firing? the CEO of Gaisuko, if sugar is performing so well, right? Rice that we never really had a, a big challenge with. Rice, they say, only grew, only grew, expanded 7%, it's called the big gram, 7 But sugar grew 28%. Where are you getting this from? I but think you know, it's like, you know, it reminds me of um, an exchange that I had with the Minister of Finance in Parliament on this whole percentage. You know, something can grow 100% if it was zero and it went to one. So a 28% does not necessarily mean a very large growth. It grew by 20%. It could just mean it grew from 1% to 1.28%. It doesn't, you know, it, it. so what I'm trying to say is that the numbers, you can, you can use the numbers to suggest something that you know in reality when you look at the actual numerical figure it's not as great as the percentage sort of indicates and so there, that's why i say when you go on the ground and you actually look at the at, at what is happening you realize that there's not much growth um in the sugar industry um in the rice industry and, and they are spending so much of their money um on other sector on, on for example on roads and buildings and stuff that i am not sure that they're doing enough in what we what we would say is a non-oil sector to ensure that it can grow and be viable on its own at this particular point. Um, so I wait to see. I will. I think I'm going to take you up with on that and actually ask a question in Parliament for him to actually lay over the numbers that led him to this particular the statement that he made. Because that they're they're throwing around out there. Uh, some of those other, other figures um, suggest that, for instance, the like like we said, sugar they're saying grew by twenty eight percent, the rice industry by seven, 
Um, they're saying that manufacturing sector, for instance, grew 25% in 2023. Mining, they were crying out that small scale miners not, um, not what, what do you call it, registering uh, their, 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 their gold uh, um, uh, yields and so on. They're saying the acquiring, mining acquiring sector grew by 42%. But Tabi, you mentioned something that's very important. When you go on the ground, it's something different. And for instance, they did say, as we said, rice, sugar grew by 28%, but sugar targets have been revised downwards several times. Several times. So if you're expecting, for instance, uh, only 100,000, right? Um, as, as your target, 100,000 tons of sugar, but it grew, but but you did one 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 fifty. Of course, you're gonna look like if you, <laughs> you exactly. know, you're all of this sugar. Exactly. Right? But the numbers, doing. they're numbers, the rigging, the rigging the numbers, Tabby. The rigging the they numbers. <laughs> they do that a lot. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yeah, folks, it's in, it's incredible, you know, when when you unpack some of this stuff, then then you see the real people, Kyle Bino, Andrew Griffith. Nayon Harding, Karen Mohammed, when you when you unpack the figures, you know, you see the you see the real people. And then um Tabby Young Boy ran out. He says that some people are hell bent and pulling down everything. Now, if you're doing nonsense, what do you want people to say? Bar Jack Neo, this uh quote is attributed this head this headline. Now, if you're the arch the architect of the skeleton sugar factory. That never produce a pound of sugar profitability. What do you want people to say, right? If you produce the fiber optic cable, you couldn't even get any fiber or the optics out of the cable. You had to abandon the whole thing. Billions of dollars, close to ten billion dollars in that project. You know the one laptop of Amtabi. You know the whole gamut of these issues. But they just want folks to sue away them. But we saw what happened before the human rights. Committee, for instance, of the United Nations just last week, Tabby, you know? money lump sum into the um the budget and so when we ask we have no clue they have no clue they keep saying they can't answer that and when they get to the minister of finance the minister of financing he doesn't know he can't answer that either because it is all there in the trillion dollar budget and so it is facetious for somebody to come to say that they're coming to parliament and they have to get approval from parliament as if the opposition has a say in what it is that they do with that money once it comes to parliament we may stand up and say what they should or should not do but at the end of the day their majority dictates what happens and so it, it I, I don't appreciate the way in which it, it it comes over as if yes we have to go to parliament and parliament has to give consent as if that means there's some consultation with the opposition and the opposition has a say and they can guide how the money is being utilized because that is not what is happening once it gets to parliament and most of us know that so that uh, when i read those statements being made time and time again i think it's very facetious and they know that but they have to give the appearance as though they have some you know that parliament is oh, there's some oversight happening at the level of parliament which is not the case some some, some independent oversight and here is what uh, the vice president was hinting at here. He said that despite Ghana's low deforestation rate, uh, some critics argue that the country's oil and gas resource development is detrimental to the environment. Uh, the vice president asserted that Ghana would remain a carbon sink even at a maximum oil and gas.
production. It's in, it's interesting. It's like saying I'm selling coals, but I'm burning it here. So I'm a good steward in the environment. I sell it to my neighbor, right? They bought there's their problem. How much you know they affect the environment over. So I will still be able to say I'm a champion of the earth because I'm not burning the coals over by me. So at maximum oil production will still be uh, you, you know a, a net zero carbon sink is interesting. I, I, I've heard him say that thing so much, so many times. Um, and if, if he wants to make that argument, he's free to make that argument. But that doesn't mean it's an accurate way to assess what is happening. Um, and I, but uh, there are two things here. I understand the the need to utilize the oil to sort of develop our country because, of course. Um, all that happened during slavery and indentureship and all of the resources and the monies that the other, the first world country was able, they were able to gain from our country that we won't really have access to those um, resources and those monies. And so we sort of seen as um, developing and not developed because of, you know, our being behind in our development plan uh, for our country. And, but the reality is that we have to understand that in our producing oil, we are also affecting the the, the environment. We can't pretend as right. if we are not. Um, right. And so the argument cannot be made as if we are, our hands are clean. If it is that we are not oil producers, we have to understand that being oil producers, we are part of the problem. And so what are we doing to, to, to balance that out as much as we can? Uh, and so it, the way in which you discuss and speak to an issue matters. So you can't speak to an issue as if you're completely ignorant of the fact that we're oil producers. We are. What does an oil producing country, what does that mean once you're producing oil? It means that we are negatively affecting the environment. But at the same time, should we not produce oil? Because we know we're affecting the environment. Or what other things can we do to reduce what um, impact our oil producing status could mean for the environment in totality. And Sherrod, I'll be quite frank with you right now. Every morning I wake up, the smoke is in my house. And I can bet my last dollar that that smoke is because they're burning to develop behind me, that the contractors are somewhere there behind there and they're burning the grass before they, they, yeah. they pick it up. And that has be, that is because we have all money now, and so we can, you know, expand our our towns and our communities and stuff like that. But it has an impact right. on our on an environment, and we can't pretend right. as if it doesn't exist. Right. I know that they're burning. They can't say it's some fog from somewhere else. Every morning I wake up, I smell the smoke, and they can't say it's it, it's the sun burning it overnight because there's no sun night time. So you, we, we, we pulling we pulling down everything, you know, and and talking about. So, I, I know I said a lot, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Um, uh, very, very welcome. Um, part of the problems that we have here too, you know, we've been keeping you guys up to date. Uh, Bashti Magnot and P. Alicock, Mark, Kyle and Sheila Boychild, um, Luan Hall, we've been keeping you guys up to date. But what's been happening with lots of the setbacks we've been happening, we've been having with our contracts, you know, they're telling us now they're going to be seeking the swift and rigid um, uh, well, swiftly and rigidly, government is cracking down on contract breaches. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and how are they doing this? Edges is going to go there and build down. You know, no more extensions, no more monies. And then you can see tomorrow in the papers, extension and more monies. Right. Well, the Attorney General is saying that this government is committed to holding contractors accountable for contract breaches. We've never seen any of that with all of these delays you see the hundreds of contracts that are being delayed, which contractor they can point to and said has been held accountable that's far, thus, thus far. Which of them, right? The AG says the government views the contract breaches as serious, as very serious and um, enforces contractual clauses swiftly in cases of breaches or delays. Which, which alternate universe is the um, attorney general living in Tabby. We're not seeing anything like that. This this is exactly what we were seeing before. It's causing the problem and trying to pretend as if they have the solution to the problem. We have said in Parliament, I remember specifically our colleague Amanda um, Walton this year, she spoke 
on numerous occasions in Parliament during budget time about the fact that we don't have the capacity for all the products that we are trying to to do and so it would result in a lot of uh, of the contracts not being able to be done in the time frame that the contracts are, are supposed to be done we have said that on so many occasions it's nothing new we knew it was going to result in this so the case is the government not wanting to recognize that they don't have the society the, the country we are not at the place where we can do so many contracts um uh, so uh, and have them done in the time that they're supposed to be done and it is basic and so to now try to blame the contractors when in the first place you should not have been giving out the contract because you know we can't do 50 contracts at one time in a country and right. get it done on time then now you want to blame the contractor when the contractor sees money goes after it as any person who wants money would do and tries as best as possible to pull off pull off the contract or the road work or the bridge uh, in, in 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 the time that he can do it but the reality is that we're not in that particular position and they should know that before they gave out the contract in the first place you do a study where were we last year does it make sense to add new projects this year or should we focus on finishing the ones you've already started before you bring new things on board but they want to be seen to be doing so by 2025 they've done 100 new roads and they widen roads that didn't need to be widened and they put more asphalt on roads that didn't need asphalt and so they want to be seen to be doing things and so we end up in this place so that thing that the, the the attorney general is now speaking of i think it's just as as i said earlier sheree it's just a sheree because they're causing the problem in the first place but here here part of what he said is that he said that despite government's urgings the government is so powerless tabby despite government urgings delays persist prompting minister agile to issue ultimatums to contractors despite urging urgings um, let's, let's the the right. You can urge somebody to do something. Yeah. Um, and, and at the same time, they're saying, you know, these contracts got built in mechanisms to, um, for redress. Uh, we've seen the Cemetery Road projects, project delayed the conversation, three uh, road projects delayed amongst others. And, you know, they're only going to tell us what you can see here on the coast. We've seen, for instance, the Payara Bridge there again in Letem, bridging uh, 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 south and north Rupununi, or the, sorry, south and north Pakaraimas there in Letem. We've seen the, uh, the, the what, what was that? Sec secondary school. Lots of the schools in the hinterland. They are delayed. Karasabai Secondary School, among others, delayed. It's, it's hundreds of projects. We'll be here all morning, you know, naming these projects. Delayed. We've seen uh, a number of what you call it the 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 pump station it's delayed nobody's being held accountable why friends family and favorites it is hard to rebuke what you're sleeping with if you get in your cut box your kickbacks your slice of the pie and so on how are you going to penalize them how oh i don't know that is why i think it's all they need to say something and so he comes out and says something but they keep doing the same thing that will cause the problem again next week or next year so until i actually see them doing something that makes sense which is starting at the root first thing no more new projects until all the projects that we have on board are completed yeah that is yeah. the first thing that you suggest that you understand that the problem is capacity to do the work and so we have to ensure that people are able to and so you don't bring anything new on stream until you figure out how to get it done on time correct correct is right we we got a lot of we got a lot of trouble in this country you know a lot of trouble all around us the police force for instance got its own trouble somebody is saying to try to solve this one of the things they're going to do is to rename the police force i think they're moving it from force to service they say force is too rough force is too tough you know, you, you, you know, it can help you solve some problems. They're going to service. You're here to provide a service that we're not going to help us. You know, what's in the name? You have the Guyana Fire Service. Yeah. Um, just a note that we have a Guyana Fire Service. Uh, but the 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 reality is, I don't think that a name. I understand the need to change the name. That is a part of the process, but that cannot be. Uh, I, I I don't want this, but our issues in the Guyana police force or service are so deep 
that to come with a surface a surface response to the issues yeah. i think it is a slap in the face of our population because we know what the problems are and we know that saying service inside the force is not going to change the mentality and the culture that pervades again the police force that causes people to act in the way that they do yeah yeah and so yeah. all that is going wrong your response is okay let's change it from force to service I'm not against the change in the name, but that cannot be the, the you know the response to everything that is going wrong. It has to be more than that. Yeah, and the minister himself, Tabby, recognized that there is a there is a need for um, for improved leadership, uh, particularly at the middle level, and the he emphasized the importance That's of himself. integrity and professionalism. They got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Why exactly. are these people then walking around behind earphone if it's there's exactly the same. The kind of force, police force got a lot of work to do. I didn't hear him say this, for instance, at the recent conference. I thought he said everything nice. He should go home first. That, that I think that is the, that is the beginning <laughs> of the turnaround of the security sector in this country. Himself and Jerry Gabay, because Jerry Gabay is there too as um, advisor on national security. He didn't know how the Venezuelan helicopter meet at um, their place at Ogle. He didn't know how the man there by he in the hotel. He didn't know how the fellow um, uh, 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 was in the um, private sector commission he headed it, who was wanted by the... He yeah. always around these people who are wanted. I never know. National security advisor. Mr. Gulib or Gulab and they had um, um, Gali Cannon. He always around these people who are wanted by the um, by the U.S. authorities for some reason. Maybe that's how he keeps an eye on them. Naomi Drucker, Tabby, says they should rename it as the Guyana Political Force, not the Guyana Police. Na Naomi for the win. Guyana Political Force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Folks, do you believe so? That would be the appropriate name. Guyana <laughs> Political Force. Thank you, Naomi. Folks, That's a good one. <laughs> folks, if you're now joining us, we share the life. Even if you've been here before, you ain't shared yet. Now is now is the opportunity to share the life. Get a political force. And as we said when we started, Tabby, you know, our standing before this um, this United Nations uh, Human Rights Committee uh, quite recently, oh my lord, is something else. It's something else. They talked about the need for comprehensive. Um, anti-discrimination legislation. They spoke about what's happening there at GCOM. They spoke about the corruption in the police force, in the judiciary, in the government, especially in the um, natural resource sector. Yeah. Right? And they talk about bringing some of these folks to justice, pursuing these allegations that you're hearing, investigating. Tabby, we ain't had a good showing at all before the um, United Nations Committee on Human Rights in recent days at all, at all, at all, at all, at all. And the government should do the responsible thing, right? Fix the problem. I think you should just resign and just get on with it. You know, I, I'm listening to you and, and remembering um, the, the the trouble that Gail Teixeira had over the last week trying to respond to some of the questions. And... You, I, what I'm thinking is that the reality of how the international community sees this country came out in what happened during that um, those the, those hearings, because sometimes you could get caught up in the persons touching down at Chelly Jagan International Airport and wanting to meet with the president, and you see the lovely pictures of you know. You have the Bill Clintons and the CIA and the Blinkens and the, and you know, you see all of these people coming down and you're thinking, oh, everybody loves Guyana and wants to, to work with the current administration and things are looking up and you're seeing the parties and the state visits and the thing and people could get carried away that, you know what, on the international stage, Guyana is looking very good. But when it comes to get people to vote with you at IPU, you see the reality. It comes to when they reach the UN and can't answer the questions appropriately and then you get a report. That is how the international community actually sees the country. Not all of that thing that you see where they come and they get some food and some duck curry 
and some cook up rice and something like that and get catfish being sent to them in Barbados and all of those things. And you get the impression, you get the impression that everything is going lovely. But what happened there at the UN is the reality of how the international community sees this country. And I hope they take stock and recognize that, you know, all the smiling doesn't mean that everybody loves you and appreciates what it is that you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a pretty interesting column in today's uh, Kaicho News. Notice I ain't, I ain't uh, majoring on Sabbath News this morning. Kaicho News, uh, this is the GH Kilal column. He said if you got um, these deeply religious people in the PPP, how come all of these unsavory things are happening in this country uh, as came out in the uh, hearings before the United Nations Human Rights Committee? How come all of these things, if you got Ayatollah Ali, this is GHK Lal's word, Archbishop Ejil and Pandita Pasad, this is Vindya Pasad, these deeply re <laughs> religious people, how come corruption is so rampant in this place? GHK Lal column today on the same issue of the United Nations Human Rights Committee. And 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 I cannot agree with him more. I think that is a very apt <laughs> uh, question to ask at this particular point in time because the 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 that's why I kept saying it's a facade, it's a charade. They try to give the impression that they're one thing, but the reality is different, and people know it. And so, as okay. much as you try to be an archbishop or an ayatollah, whatever it is that you try to be. The reality is that when you go and you speak with people who have to interact with you on a daily basis, speak with people who have to deal with the policy that you implement, and you realize that things are not working out the way you give the impression they are. You know, you come, you come to parliament and you speak so glowingly and, you know, with a perspective, you know, like if you're, you're the mother of all things good and decent. And then when you have to deal with persons who are in your own workplace, who have to deal with you on a daily basis and cannot don't like the fact that they have to work with you because of your, you know, the way in which you interact with them. You know that on the ground is a different situation. Guyanese yeah. know it. Yeah. Guyanese, so no matter how much you give that impression, Guyanese know that the PPP is not good for this country, that they're not good for the people of this country, and they're not good for the development of this country. We know it. It was a case mm -hmm. of putting the right systems in place to ensure by 2025, we kick them out and say that we don't need you back here anymore. Guyanese know, know the fact from the fiction. Guyanese know the fact from the fiction. Um, and it's something that we that we that we are happy with. Um, but we gotta do so much more. We gotta get them out of government. You know, an election is coming up. We got lots of work to do. Magnel Barrow and Kyle Bino, Naomi Drucker. Um <laughs> Naomi said, we know the old story, yeah. Guyanese know it. Mark, Diane Abrams, Sabina Blue, and all the other folks joining us this morning. I think we're going to leave it there this morning. So much, so much happened over, 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 over the weekend. Gavin Caesar says Jack New has turned the PPP into a criminal organization. Oh. Yep, yep, yep. Mark says Tabitha, it's reality versus perception. Yes. Glenn says Ghana, for Ghana to grow, PPP, the PPP must grow. Must grow. <laughs> yeah. Magnet Barrow said there is the Antichrist. Right? Them is the Antichrist again. Mark says the Fisher Bishop. That too. That too, Mark. Yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot happening. It's a lot happening, folks. And we're gonna stay out front, bringing you guys the valid and credible information. Um, as we wind down, as we wrap up, folks, if you had again to talk, I want to advise you uh, to touch base with the Alistair Collins Farm there in, uh, what street is that? Lamaha Street between Camp and Waterloo Streets on the ground floor of the Carrion Mall. You need a good justice of the peace, Commissioner of Votes, Trappy Davis. We want to recommend the Alistair Collins Firm. And folks, the week has just started. It's a short work week, given the fact that yesterday uh, was a holiday there, Tabby. Um, and so we want to encourage you guys to make the best of it. Uh, it's a good four days ahead of us. And we hope that you, you guys have hit the ground running this morning, Julia Lewis, Mark, Zero Hero, what's Zero Hero? Debbie Collins, Colin Barnwell, Tabitha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we get these names from Zero Hero. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny one. Ross <laughs> Ricardo says, PP's a cross. Yeah.
Well, if they say it, we don't have to, right? <laughs> so at least it shows the sentiment of the people yeah. and how they view those persons who are in government. Um, like you, Sharon, I, you know, the reality is that uh, on one hand, we have to deal with those who are in power who really do not care about the people. But at the same time, we still have to get up and we have to go to work and we have to um, have our goals set and our vision set for ourselves and we keep we keep moving forward, cognizant of the reality of our situation and cognizant that when the time comes, we know what we need to do. Um, the the do you have, as you said, Justin, we have a four day week, and I just want to wish you guys all the best this week. I'll be on with Sharon yeah, a couple more days this week before I move off the scene again. <laughs> you, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't with you last Thursday, I think. Um, but it's good being here, and to guys out there, just have a good day, stay safe, please look out for each other, please. If you're driving, drive in the corner, drive with the, the five C's in mind. We don't need to rush to get anywhere. Just get there alive and safe. I think that is what is most important because we don't right. want our loved ones crying for us because we would have gotten ourselves on um, in, a, in any accidents. So stay safe, guys, and be good to yourselves this week and each other. All right. And that's your final word, folks. Stay safe. That's our time. That's